Hello out there and welcome to your next mission video podcast. We have a terrific show for you today because today is a very special day. We are thrilled to bring back to our show Colonel Retrieved Wang Wagner as we celebrate Dr. Martin Luther King's birthday and explore his legacy. Please stay tuned. You won't want to miss this special episode. Welcome to your next mission video podcast where we tell the stories of those who have served in the past and those who are serving today. From transition to financial wellness, VA benefits to mental health, we cover issues facing veterans, active military, and their families. Now here's your host, the 12th Sergeant Major of the Army and co-founder of the American Freedom Foundation, Jack L. Tilly. Hello out there, warriors, past and present, and your families. Thank you for your service to our great country. Now, before we get started, I personally want to thank our presenting sponsors, Blue Cross Blue Shield, FEP Dental, and FEP Vision, Navy Federal Credit Union, Purdue Global, and USAA for making your next mission happen. They love our veterans and families. I say it every episode, we love them too. We're gonna to be talking about Dr. Martin Luther King, his legacy, and all he has meant to our great country. And I'm so excited to introduce Colonel Dwayne Wagner, United States Army retired and former assistant professor of the United States Army Command and General Staff College. Welcome back to the show. Sir, thank you so much. Uh, I had a great time with our first show. And when you asked me to come back, it was very easy for me to say yes, especially since we're talking about such a significant historical figures, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Absolutely, sir. Sir, before we get started though, uh, uh, could you tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Yes, I can do that. I'm a military brat. I was raised by a Sergeant First Class who served in Korea and Vietnam for 22 years. And uh, I served in uniform for 30 years as a military police officer, working in mainly corrections, combat support, and um, personnel. After retiring and taking the uniform off, I served as an assistant professor of the Command and General Staff College, where I taught uh, policy, strategy, and intergovernmental uh, operations. I recently retired full-time and moved from Kansas to Indiana so I can be around, so my wife and I could be around our four grandchildren, and we live in the Evansville, Indiana area. Well, you know, being around those grandkids, that's certainly very important. I, I, like I told you before, I have uh, four great, great grandbabies and one on the way. And uh, grandkids or uh, uh, grandkids or kids in general are so important just to, to be around. Sir, as a, as a child of the 60s, how did Dr. Martin Luther King, you know, influence your life? I remember watching the television during the civil rights movement and learning from Dr. Martin Luther King the right way to make change or ask for change in America. Uh, The 60s were a scary time, a very scary time. And Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was a beacon of hope because he had both the charisma, the intelligence, and the ability to work with so many different people to try to move America forward. And when I say move America forward, I'm talking about the several different communities within America in the 1960s. Yeah. So, so what do you think that uh, is the most important, um, impactful legacy that uh, Dr. King left, you know, for our country? If you force me to choose one from several, I think it's the legacy of trying to seek change with peaceful ways or peaceful methods and without violence. That is his legacy. And even in 2023, as we look across America and we watch different groups try to help America move forward, every now and then someone will say, let's not forget what Dr. Martin Luther King said about taking a peaceful approach if we can. Yeah, one one of the things that always amazes me is is people don't want to learn about other people. You know what I mean? Everybody has a different philosophy, a different, I mean, everybody has their own world they live in. And sometimes they, uh, 
they they judge you for something they don't even know, I guess. But they don't. But I think if we want to be smart about our country, we need to learn about each other. And I think sometimes we miss the bubble on that. I talk about tribalism. Yeah. And I use tribalism to make sure I understand that the the better I get to know people who are not like me. Yeah. Then as I move forward, we're we're going to get along better. America is comprised of so many types of tribes and sorts of tribes. You know, we have this one big tribe of being an American. Being an American is a tribe. And if we can get all the sub-tribes to focus on first being an American and what that means, I think we can move forward. You know, it's really funny, not funny you say that, but, uh, you know, when people get out of the military, that's what they look for. They look for other people that served in the military, so they want to find their tribe so they fit, you know, they they feel comfortable and they fit in. And I think that everybody's learned. I, but again, I go back to saying that we need to learn more about each other. We need to teach each other about the, the differences, the likes and dislikes of that stuff. Can you describe an America without Dr. Martin Luther King's, uh, you know, his influence? That's, that's an interesting question. America without Dr. Martin Luther King, in my mind, is 20 to 30 years behind where she is today. Yeah. America was going to integrate. Integration was going to happen. And America was going to move forward with pushing inequality toward equality and trying to bring those who are poor or disenfranchised or immigrants or African-American or black into the big American tent. That was going to happen. Martin Luther King, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, spurred that in the 1960s. So an America without Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., I think the civil rights movement happens 20 years later. I don't have any proof. It's, it's just my gut. Yeah. You know, I, I sometimes I talk to people all the time about uh, about what we're talking about right now. And one of the things I think we should do, I, I, I wish that everybody sort of looked like the military because it's a melting pot in the military. I mean, we all sort of come together. And, and I may have said this last time on your show. I know I've said it a couple of times that I'm not once when I was in the military did I ask what color somebody was to my left or right. I didn't care. What I cared was, can they do the job? Can they perform? And, and, uh, and we're all brothers and sisters and we got the job done. So that was a that was important, you know, for me, especially as I'm sure it was important for you, too. Yes, yes. In, in, in your mind, has the has a federal holiday been embraced by most Americans, or is, is it still just uh, often viewed as a, you know, as a holiday for just African Americans? I think in 2023, and, and, and as we move into 2024, and as we speak in 2024, uh, it's now more seen as an American holiday. But let's not kid ourselves. And this is me speaking personally. It has not reached the stature or the importance where it's recognized as a federal holiday by all. It's much better than when it was first designated, but we're not where we need to be in terms of people getting up in the morning and embracing the holiday, having a conversation with their family about the holiday or attending an, an event. Uh, we're not there yet. Uh, I don't know how long it's going to take before it's fully embraced, but we're better than where we were uh, when we first started. You know, when I look back at my life, uh, and I'm sure as you look back at your life, we've came a long ways. I mean, I don't, you know, I mean, we've changed and, and moved and adjusted and went through a lot, some tough times. But I think we've made a lot of, of very, uh, very positive adjustments in our society. I, I don't know what you, I mean, I mean, I've seen a lot of good coming out of it. You're always... You're always, just like Dr. Martin, you're always going to have struggles. You're always going to have issues. You're always going to have concerns. And you're always going to have on one side the naysayers, the other side the, other, you know, the other side, yeah, yeah, let's do it. Uh, but the majority of people, I think, just need to, like I said before, need to learn more about each other so we don't struggle as much as a, as a nation, I guess. You just described the title of, of an article I wrote. We, we've come a long ways. We have a way to go where I take several situations to try to show how far America and the military uh, have come. But if you talk privately with some individuals and at, over coffee and ask them to share their observations, their beliefs, we're not where we need to be. And that's, that's the friction. Yes, we've come a long way, 
but we're not where we need to be because we can do better. And so much of that is based on where you stand. As a 67 year old black man, I can tell you that I've seen progress. But when I when I walk into some rooms, I can still sense that I have to first prove who I am before some people fully embrace me. And I'm not quite sure you or others have to go through that. And it, it's not a science. I can't put numbers on it. Yeah. It's 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 more of a it's more more qualifiable based on experience and people. But this goes back to our conversation about tribalism. Mm -hmm. You talked about soldiers wanting to leave the military and to find people who are like them. I ask soldiers when they leave the military to find people who are not like them. Yeah. To integrate into the community, to meld into the community. Yeah, go and find some military buddies, but there's some blue collar, white collar, some some industrial folks out there who, who know nothing about the military, the army, and you should try to find a way to join their tribe. Yeah. You, you know, one time somebody had asked me to come and uh, uh, speak at uh, a uh, Martin Luther King event or a Black History Month, one or the other. I can't remember which one it was. And uh, and when I got there, the majority of people in the audience were were minorities. And I was probably, I was probably one or two you know, white guys that were in the, in the crowd. And, I, and after I left there, I thought to myself, you should get more people that look like me to talk at your events. Because I think a lot of times what we have is we have a, a group of, um, of uh, African-Americans that get together and they have another African-American talk. Well, that's great news and you're doing a great job, but you need somebody that's a little bit different. So if you want to educate me, get me involved in the, in the process. I'm going to piggyback on that. I spoke at Park University um, early last year. And during the question and answer period, I made the comment to the audience, why can't I be the guest speaker for Women's History Month? And I shared with the audience why I thought I should be able to be the guest speaker for Women's History Month. And I, I looked at uh, Brigadier General uh, Wampler, who was sitting at the front seat, and basically said that General Wampler doesn't look like me, but he cares about me. You don't look like me, but you care about me. You don't have to be one to care about one. And we need to move away from that. Yeah. You, you know, it's, I don't know how it happened, but when I was a... Uh... When I was a uh, battalion sergeant major, I, I put a color guard together, and they got a color guard, and it was, uh, uh, I think it was all white soldiers. And I said, wait a minute now. I said, you can't do that. And, and nobody ever told me not to do that. I mean, they probably wouldn't have said anything. I said, but that that uh, formation or that color guard has to represent the United States Army in our formations. And so if you put it together and there's not a minority, or nowadays not a minority or female or whatever, then it sort of seems a, a different signal to the people that are looking at that color guard. And, uh, and at first, uh, they didn't get it. But on the other side of that, I got to be a brigade sergeant major, and I had a, uh, a black sergeant major that put all a color guard together. It was all a black uh, formation. And I said, hey, sergeant major. And, and, and to be honest with you, he didn't get it. He didn't understand it. And I tried real hard to get him to understand uh, because I said, you, you, you can't go one way or the other as a leader. In any formation, you have to make sure what's right for on the right side, for the left side, and the middle. For all of us, it's not about you personally. It's about what's right for the Army, right for our country, too. Right. The phrase I've used, the phrase I used when I was in uniform, when, when confronted with those sorts of situations, and during my 30-year career, it happened several times, I would ask the leader, does that color guard look like and reflect America? And each time they would say, no, sir. Well, can we find a color guard that, that does that? I would try to get them to understand the importance of people seeing themselves in our symbols. Yeah. Yeah. That, no, I, I agree 100%. Sir, this is a great, a great uh, discussion. I, I probably need to talk to you for a couple hours here. We're going to take a quick break. So hold on there. We'll be right back. We're talking with Colonel Retired Dwayne Wagner. If you're enjoying watching or listening to your next question, please like us, click on that subscribe button below, and click on the bell to receive notifications of all of our upcoming video podcasts. Sir, with so much going on in our country now, with the wars in Ukraine and the 
you know, in the Middle East and the civil unrest uh, we're experiencing. How do you think Dr. King would view the state of our country and the world right now? Man, you ask tough questions, don't That's you? a great question. <laughs> when I think about uh, Russia and Ukraine, and then I reflect on what's going on with Israel and Gaza, and the fact that we've sent American troops in a supporting role to both regions. Yeah. Uh, Dr. King's legacy and philosophy rings, rings very clear. He would say, and I'm about to quote Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Dr. Martin Luther King was, was a strong opponent of the Vietnam War. And he would talk about finding a way for the tribes to coexist and to get along. He would think our world is, is in a mess and that we should find a way to bring tribes together and to coexist in the same, the same regions. And I know that's a simplistic response, but that's Dr. Martin Luther King in terms of, of the humanity of man regarding who he or she is. Can't we find a way to coexist and, and to get along? Yeah. One of the things I always think about, and I'd be interested to see what you think about it too, is is that I think that we have uh, young kids, and I'm not going to pick any region in, in, around the world, but we have uh, kids that are born that are sort of taught to hate a specific group of people, a specific uh, tribe of people. And, and so they start at maybe one or two or three or four or five or ten years old hating uh, certain people that probably don't look like them or in a different country or whatever, a different religion. Uh, I, I don't know how you stop that. I, I'm new, I don't know how we... We stop that hatred, and all it is is hatred. I don't think we can stop it. It's a, it's a part of being human, yeah. and it's a part of tribalism. We all grow up within a tribe where elders teach us how to think. And if elders teach us to hate, we're going to grow up with that hate. And I'm going to give you a family story. My mother, who passed away about 20 years ago, uh, grew up in Texas. She was taught to hate whites Yeah, until she became an adult and she learned that people are people. Um, and I have four grandchildren. One happens to be white and my son adopted her. So my mother is a great grandmother of a white child. And she would love that child if she lived today. Yeah. So we, we, we grow up learning hate, and as we become older, hopefully through travel or interaction, we move away from it. Yeah. You, you know, when I was a young kid, I, I, I remember there was uh, two guys in my school that I went to school, uh, Herman Bain and Hershey's Bain. There's really, uh, Herman Bain was in the same grade that I was, and Hershey's was uh, a couple of years ahead, but they're both outstanding football players. But uh, but I just, I just, I don't I just looked at them as them, Herman and Hershey. I mean, I didn't know them very well. I, Herman, I knew a little bit because he's in my same same uh, grade, and I talked to him every once in a while. But it, I, I guess I never thought about anything other than as a person, just like me. And and uh, and I didn't look at him any differently. I can say that probably most people won't believe me, but I didn't I didn't care. Uh, I mean, he lived in the same area I did, went to the same school, we talked to the same people. So it was just just a kid, just like me, trying to grow up in life. I would love for you to have a cup of coffee with him today and to ask him to share his life story with you since high school to see the difference or the or the sameness. So yes, you two were friends in high school and you got along well, but I bet his travels, his journey, his experience are a tad different than yours based on tribalism in his tribe. Well, the other thing is I don't see what he sees. There you go. I don't see. I, in fact, I have a good friend, uh, uh, Sergeant Major Myers, Johnny Myers, and and it was sort of funny one time. We was we was going somewhere, and he says, uh, you know, every time I go through this particular TSA, they always search me and check me. And I says, I don't know why. They never check me. <laughs> you know, so, so one time we went, and uh, he got checked because I was with him. They checked me, too, and I thought, isn't that unusual? But anyway, I mean, like little things like that, 
but, but then on the other side of that is sometimes I think uh, we could have a tendency to dig a little bit deeper than we should. You know what I mean? We, we, our perception may be they're doing something out of the ordinary where they're maybe just doing their job. So I think we got to have a little bit of a practical and That's sense. the challenge. Yeah. My, my challenge as a 67-year-old black man in America yeah. is to be self-aware and self-reflective and to be careful not to jump too quickly and assume X, Y, or Z or, ne or yeah. negativity regarding the situation. But however, let's flip over to the other side of that coin. Uh, if you and I were to have a cup of coffee face to face, I could share two or three stories with you that have occurred during the last two years. And you would shake your head and look at me and say, Colonel Wagner, you have to be kidding me. Yeah, I, I don't I don't know if you know Vince Patton and Albert Michael, uh, Sergeant Major the Sergeant Major Marine Corps and uh, Vince was the Master Chief Petty Officer of the Coast Guard, they're both minorities. And, and we talk about stuff every once in a while. And Al was, uh, Al had got stopped or something like that. And he, he went into about how they treated him. And it was a little bit different. And I thought, ah, you know, that's good. Come on, you're probably looking. And he said, no, anyway, so I, I hear uh, what you're talking about there, going back to the school and talking to uh, Herman there a little bit. But uh, I hear that from other people. And sometimes it's, it's hard for me to believe, but I'm not naive to think it doesn't happen either. So I, I got that. Are we so divided now in 2023 that Dr. King would worry about the, you know, the future of America? I think he would worry about the future of America. Uh, he would, in my view, he would take a look at the political division and he would wonder if America was becoming the best version of herself. Yeah. We have to remember that Dr. Dr. King was a, he was a positive believer. He would try to find a way to think through or assume that with the right people, America could be put on a, a virtuous path. But he would be, I think he would be concerned about the, the future of America. And I'm going to go a, a, a further, I'm going to take one more step on that. Um, as all of us look forward, Silently, there are some people who are concerned. Publicly, there are some people who are making negative predictions about this is going to happen or or that's going to happen. So, so yes, there is some concern about the uh, future of America. But let's remember this. Let's remember this because sometimes people have a very short memory. If you go all the way back to 1776 to come forward and you take a look at the American journey, We've been here before. America has been here before where she was tested with whether or not she would survive. Uh, so we need to we need to understand we've been here before. Yeah. You, you know, uh, yeah, that's I, I agree with you 100 percent. One of the things that uh, that bothers me uh, all the time is is people that are in the limelight all the time, that are role models, whether or not you're a congressman or senator, a football player, a baseball player, or whatever, any kind of sports. Like that. They're role models for our country. And, and sometimes I, I get the impression that uh, a lot of them are not very good role models, that they put out negative stuff and young kids see those and, and they sort of want to you know, be like them. They want to act like them. And, and I think people, again, especially our politicians, I, I mean, it's, it's about, lead, it's, you know, just like the Army, lead by example, good leadership, good communication skills. And I, it bothers me that we have people at every level that I just talked about that get up there and, and say some things that are either hateful or, or don't uh, represent our country in the best way. Yeah, you're talking to populism and the populist movement. And you're correct. Your observation is 100% is valid. You, you grew up in a time where people were more concerned about how, how they were viewed by society yeah. than by others. Um, that doesn't exist as much today. I need to be very careful because those people believe that they're doing right by their cause or their culture or their movement. But I think uh, no matter where you stand, left or right, regardless of subculture, we're all Americans. Yep. All of us are Americans. 
And uh, we need to sometimes keep that in the back of our mind as we try to move America forward. We don't need to burn down the house to, to make change. Yeah. You know, the best advice I got to, uh, well, some of the best advice, I got a lot of advice all the time when I was Sergeant Major of the Army, but, but a friend of mine, John Stevens, I always like to talk about uh, Sergeant Major Stevens, but he called me up and he says, hey, look, he said, uh, can I give you some advice? I said, yeah, well, sure, go ahead. He says, first of all, don't change who you are. And I think sometimes people have a tendency to, to where they're at or what they're doing. They want to change. They want to change the perception of how people look at them. So don't change who you are because that's why they put you in that position. He said, the second thing is, he said, 50% of the people will like you and 50% of the people won't like you. So when you make a decision, make a decision that's best for the United States Army. Same in our country. Make a decision that's best for the country, not for you personally. It's best for the country. And I think sometimes we, we miss the bullet on that. People are more concerned about self versus what's right for us. I understand. Yeah. Hey, sir, this is a great discussion. Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, we need to take a quick break, a commercial break here with you. But, but uh, when we come back, I, I want to discuss the poems you've written. How do you think about uh, you know, what Dr. King would respond to your words uh, when we come back? So stay right there. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. We'll be right back. You're watching your Next Mission video podcast. You're watching your Next Mission video podcast, proudly presented by... Navy Federal Credit Union, the most trusted credit union owned by members of the military community, serving all branches of the armed forces and their families. Their members are the mission. Learn more at NavyFederal.org. Purdue Global, you're ready for a comeback. And with Purdue Global, you can do more than take classes. You can take charge of your story, of your career, of your life. Earn a degree you can be proud of and get an education employer's respect. Start your comeback at PurdueGlobal.edu. USAA. Oh. A promise is a trust not to be broken. Right, Whether spoken with an oath or sealed with a pinky. And after 100 years, we're still taking care of the military community and their families. That's our mission, always. Now back to your host, the 12th Sergeant Major of the Army, Jack L. Tilly. Welcome back. We're blessed to be here today with uh, Colonel Retired Dwayne Wagner, and we're celebrating Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday, talking about his legacy. Remember, this is our show. Tell us what topics you want us to cover. Tell us about your transition. You can call or text me at 844-424-1134 or send me an email at smatilly at yournextmission.org, and I'll actually reach back out to you. Sir, you've... Uh, You've written two poems, hopefully I say these correctly now, Scattered Soldiers and Juneteenth. Uh, how could someone find those online if they'd like to, you know, like to read them? Those two poems can be um, found at Army University Press. All, Google Army University Press, comma, Colonel Dwayne Wagner, comma, with the name of the poem, Scattered Soldiers or Juneteenth, you can find, you can find both poems. Um, but what I plan on doing is once you publish this podcast, I'm going to put both poems on the thread so people have access to them. Oh, thank you, sir. The, 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 in that fact, that's a great idea. The, uh, in Scattered Soldiers, you talked about our war in Afghanistan and the, and the battles fought. If Dr. King read your poem, would he nod his head yes, or would he nod his head no? Yeah. Scattered soldiers. Um, in the 60s, my father went to Vietnam, and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was an opponent of America's involvement in, in Vietnam. We scattered soldiers all over that region in, in Viet Vietnam. So when I was going back and forth to Afghanistan from Washington, D.C., I would think about the number of American soldiers we had scattered all over, all over the world, trying to support our national security objectives. I think Dr. King would read my poem, and he would nod his head yes, and he would say, 
Colonel Wagner, you you understand. Because scattered soldiers is a is a plea for America to self-reflect on why we send our warriors where we send them and how long should we continue to do that. And that poem was written based on the struggles of, of warriors who were coming out of theater as I tried to teach them at CGSC. It came from my heart. Yeah. You know, one of the things that uh, that she just made me think about, you know, not many people know about the military. You know, they either, they learn about it from the, the news, a book, uh, uh, a movie, a social media, maybe word of mouth. But not a lot of people know about the kind of struggles that go on in Afghanistan and Ukraine and the kind of the battles that, uh, you know, soldiers, uh, the kind of things soldiers do. The other thing they don't realize is the kind of uh, invisible wounds that they have when they come back from war that, uh, that'll that never go away for them. My father went to Korea in 1950 and Vietnam in 1968. My father served 22 years and he was an alcoholic and he finally stopped drinking. Uh, he would never talk to me about Korea. He was an infantryman in Korea and he wouldn't talk to me about Vietnam. And the only time I saw my father cry was when I took him to the Vietnam War Memorial after I was promoted to Lieutenant Colonel in 1995. The only time I ever saw my father cry. So those invisible wounds exist today. Uh, whether you talk Iraq, Afghanistan, we have, we have three generations of warriors who are fighting some battles. Yeah, you, you know, I, I tell people all the time, we're, we're trained or taught in the military to keep things to yourself. And you know, don't share uh, your personal feelings about stuff. And, and I did an interview with somebody here not too long ago, and they, they said, you're pretty open about your post-traumatic stress. I said, I need to be. I said, I think everybody should be open. A lot of people just don't, don't talk about those, uh, those issues where we should talk. Uh, and, and the more people that talk about those issues, the better it makes for the rest of them, or better it makes it for the rest of them. So, Sir, in your poem, Juneteenth, I hope I'm saying that correctly, you wrote about America's newest holiday, do you think that celebration aligns with Dr. King's vision of America? Juneteenth. I think it does. And, and Dr. Martin Luther King had a vision of all Americans being treated with dignity and respect, all Americans having opportunities, and all Americans having the ability to move to move forward in their life. If you take a look at Juneteenth, the poem, it talks to the three different time frames where Americans were freed. 1776, the American Revolution. 1865, the American Civil War. But it was Juneteenth when the rest of the slaves in Texas were freed that everybody was free. So yes, we had an American Civil War and we freed the enslaved Africans. But even after doing that, we had, we had people in Texas who had not received the word and they were not free. Juneteenth represents their freedom. So after Juneteenth, all of us were free. Yeah, you, you know, uh... I guess when I when I hear you talk about that, you got to walk in my shoes. You know what I mean? If you haven't walked in my shoes, I don't know exactly how you feel. That's that's just like uh, when it starts uh, race relations or anything else. If I haven't walked in your shoes, just like my good friend Brian, uh, Johnny, if I don't walk in his shoes, I don't know how people treat him, how they talk to him, how they look at him. And so it's a little bit different. All I can say is is what I do as an individual. You know, I treat everybody with dignity and respect, and, and I want people to treat me the same way. So... So before we get into our final thoughts, what, what do you think the next 20 years will look like when it comes to race relations you know, in our country? I think the next 20 years will be much like the last five to 10 years. I think social media is, is contributing to the ability of people to have a voice. So more Americans are going to see 
how others feel and how others believe and, and see their experiences. And there's going to be some friction. Now, do I think it's going to be the sort of friction that tears the nation apart as some people predict America's going to have a civil war in the future? No, I don't. Um, we've always had these sorts of fissures and friction in our nation. I just think we are more aware of them because of social media. I'm not a historian. I'm not a political scientist. I don't have a PhD. This is me talking as someone who has seen a lot. Yeah. You know, so one of the things, I think there's, there's a lot of positive with social media, but I think there's a few negative in there, too. I think sometimes you have people that, uh, I don't know, that just uh, fire around at your bow and don't even know what they're talking about as far as what the issues are, what the concerns are. And I think the other thing about social media that sometimes bothers me, uh, that, that, uh, that they just spew a lot of hatred and say a lot of things that, that uh, may or not be true. And uh, that's, uh, I, th I don't know if you could ever stop that, probably don't want to stop it, but uh, I think one of the things you got to do, though, is, is uh, and I always tell people this, you got to be a good communicator, but you also got to be a good listener to people. Listen and respect uh, whatever their rights are, whatever they want to do, but respect what they're saying. You may not agree with them. My wife says that all the time to me. At least let me get a word in wise. I see you've always got the last word. But uh, yeah, I just think we got to talk more. We got to sit down and talk to her and be, uh, you know, better role models for our country. And that's what, you know, a little bit guys, old, I'm older than you are, so, but little older guys, more mature guys need to be helping develop the younger generation for the future. I think that's important. Sir, any, you know, this has been a, go ahead, sir, do you have something to say? Yeah. You didn't ask this question. Uh, social media is kind of like this pen. Yeah. I can use this pen for positivity and write and communicate, or I can take this pen and stab you in the eye <laughs> and use it as a weapon. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to throw the pen away. Yeah. I just want to teach people how to properly use the pen. Yeah. And that's what we have with social media. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you got, it goes back to one thing, e education, development, communications, all the way through. That's that's for Doug Unsure. So this has been a great, a great discussion. I Again, I appreciate you taking the time to come on the show. And I thank you for for what you're doing, not just for yourself, but really for our country and our service members and, you know, everybody around you, because I know you're just a, a wealth of knowledge. And, and just, you know, just by talking to you, I know that you truly care and you want to make a difference. And I appreciate that. Any final thoughts, something you want to share with the audience that maybe we missed? People will ask me all the time. They'll say, Dwayne, uh, do we need another Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in America? And I quickly say no. In the 1960s, African-Americans, Black Americans, America needed a Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. To, to have a voice. I think in 2024, as we move forward, we need for people to work locally in their communities yeah. to make their own communities better and to be less concerned about what's going on in Washington. Work locally within your own community and you be a mini Dr. Martin Luther King Jr in your own town. Yeah, that's, well, probably I'll just add to that. Turn off the TV, don't listen to the news. <laughs> hey, sir, God bless you, and thank you for coming on. And again, thank you for what you do and what you uh, continue to do. Thank you very much. Thanks again to Colonel Retired Dwayne Wagner for being our guest for us today. I'm Jack Tilly, 12th Sergeant Made the Army, and you've been watching your next Mission Video Podcast. And, and thank you for joining us please log in at our website at yournextmission.org and, and leave me a review. Hopefully it's a good review, but if it's not, I guess I can live with that. While you're there, you can visit our nonprofit and corporate partners and, who have all the jobs and services that are available that can assist you in your transition from the military. And there's always an end to everything. And we just added a, a new job board in partnership with Recruit Military, where you can search for a job that's a perfect fit for you. Check out the this video on our website. Learn how to, to fine-tune your search. You can also create your own individual profile. Scan the QR code on the screen or the QR code on the website and create your own profile. All information collected is confidential and won't be shared with anyone. Please know 
we want to help you any way we can. I'm going to say that again. Please know we, all of us, we want to help you any way we can. You can follow me on all my personal social media pages, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Rumble. And if you liked what we're doing with uh, Your Next Mission, click on that subscribe button below. And don't forget to click on the bell to receive notifications about all of our upcoming video podcasts. Don't forget, we want to hear from you. Please leave me a message or send me a text at 844-424-1134. Send me an email at uh, smatilly at yournextmission.org. Thanks again to Colonel Wagner for joining us today. It was just uh, just great uh, having him on the show for the second time. Uh, he's a, a wonderful person. And I guess my final thoughts for you guys today is uh, we all live in America. We're all the same. We all bleed the same. We all fight together. And we all just need to live together. This is a great country, but we need to communicate more. We need to be better role models. We need to show young adults what's right and what's wrong. But we're in the coaching and teaching method when you're a little bit older like me and the colonel. Again, this is a, it's, it's not about me. It's, it's what's right for us, for our country, and the, for the people that uh, live in this country. One last thing I'm going to tell you. Think of the positive about life. Too many people here lately have been thinking about, woe is me, I can't get anything done. But I do. I love this country, and I love all of you. So help each other. Do all you can to help your, your brother and sister, no matter where you're at. Again, thanks for watching. Thanks to New Mind Students, of course, our presenting sponsors, Blue Cross Blue Shield, FEP Dental, and FEP Vision, Navy Federal Credit Union, Purdue Global, and USAA. We appreciate all you do for our military. And as always, see you on the high ground. hoo -ah! You've been listening to Your Next Mission, brought to you by the American Freedom Foundation. Learn more by visiting yournextmission.org.